Okay, I see 100 participants online and still going up. Uh, that's a good time to get started. Welcome everybody. My name is Martina Bianchini and I'm the president of IFRA. And uh, we welcome you today to this green chemistry workshop with uh, John Warner and with companies. On the next slide, we see what are we uh, setting out to do in this green chemistry project. As you know, IFRA is currently running a green chemistry project and uh, the project started uh, recently, only in the beginning of this year. And it's a time bound project that will seek to bring results for the IFRA Global Fragrance Summit in November. So the objective of this green chemistry project was to raise more awareness of the 12 principles of green chemistry, because that is what we have in the IFRA IOFI Sustainability Charter, element 0.23. And uh, we want to put more meat on the bone, more toolbox, uh, a higher toolbox for people to, first of all, identify and prioritize the green chemistry principles for the fragrance industry. And then third objective, is to provide direction for scientists and other industry professionals towards greener, safer chemical choices and design. So this is the context of this webinar. And uh, the timeline that we have is that we seek within this project to have a report ready by 8th, 9th November, 2022, which is when our Global Fragrance Summit will take place. And the project uh, would have three webinars featuring uh, John Warner, the father of green chemistry. And the first one already took place on the 23rd of March. Several of you were there, probably many of you were there. And today we have the second webinar where we also hear from three companies. We hear from Simrise, we hear from Firmenich, and we will hear from Mann later on about how they approach green chemistry in their uh, company strategies. And without any further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Amy Cannon from Beyond Benign, who is our partner for this project. And Amy will introduce John Warner. All right, thank you so much, um, Martina. Let me turn off my closed captioning. Um, it's it's I'm thrilled to be working with IFRA on this project and just wanted to briefly introduce myself, Amy Cannon. I am the executive director and co-founder of Beyond Benign. We're a US-based nonprofit focused on green chemistry education and training the next generation of scientists to be able to design and implement green chemistry in their um, practice. Uh, we're also working with Amy Perlmutter, who's on the line. Um, so you'll see us in the background. We'll be helping to moderate and field the question and answer session during this workshop. So really happy to um, see you all online today and have this and hear more, dig a little bit deeper into green chemistry and hear a little bit more about some of these tools within the flavors and fragrance industry as well. Just as formalities for workshop format, um, feel free to update your Zoom name to include your affiliation so we know where you're from. This webinar is being recorded. So just as a, a heads up there, it is being recorded and to share with member companies as well. Um, there will be a, a Q&A session following the presentations, but do feel free to type any questions into the question and answer chat box within, your, um, within the panel display. Type them in at any time and we'll, we'll consolidate them and, and we'll address them at the end after the presentations. Um, and again, as, as we said in the first workshop, the questions and feedback and, and dialogue um, that we hear during this workshop will be used to inform the, the, the compass tool that we'll be, that we'll be uh, finalizing that Martina mentioned for November, but also the content for workshop number three. So please, um, please do speak up and ask some questions. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. John Warner. Um, he is our, our featured speaker for this, this web workshop as well. 
Um, and if you were on the last one, then you might not need an introduction, but John Warner is one of the founders of the field of green chemistry and defined green chemistry through the uh, defining um, 12 principles of green chemistry in the text, Green Chemistry Theory and Practice, along with Paul Anastas back in the 90, 1990s. Um, so not only did he help define and shape the field, but he's a, a very prolific innovator and inventor and um, inspiring, I would say, um, inspiring voice within the green chemistry community to motivate and, and um, accelerate the adoption of green chemistry across all industry sectors. So he's a, a prolific inventor having invented over uh, or having a whole holding over 300 patents and numerous publications. And, um, and he's also been an award winner for some, uh, some high honors here in the US, the, the Perkin Medal, and being recognized um, at the presidential level for some of his work in education and mentoring. Um, we're really excited to have John. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and hand it over to John um, to take it away for the next part of this presentation. Well, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Martina. And very, very proud to, to be part of, of these workshops that obviously anyone who ever heard me speak before, I know I'm very passionate about the importance of what we're talking about today and I'm super proud of IFRA for taking a leadership role in creating this change within the industry. And um, it is so important for leadership to emerge for us to get to a sustainable future. And I compliment and am proud to be part of, of IFRA's activities to do that. I'm going to um, share my screen. So I need someone to acknowledge that I've done this successfully. Have, have I correctly shared my screen? Yes, looks good. Cool. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, so my my role today is, you know, really to set the stage. We're going to hear from three different organizations and how they have developed tools around green chemistry, sustainability, and whatnot. And what I wanted to do is, is I wanted to take a step back and frame the situation in a way that probably everybody has thought of in one way or another, but offer some clarity. And so again, I, I love to use analogies. And so I'm gonna start with an analogy and I'm gonna talk about the game of golf, okay? Now, if anyone knew me, it is hilarious for me to talk about golf. I do not play golf. I am the worst golfer in the world. But Dr. Amy Cannon, my wife, is an amazing golfer. And so having watched her play golf and understand the game of golf through her, I kind of get some sense of golf. All right. Imagine that we wanted to evaluate different golfers. OK, well, we would want to know how far can the golfer drive the ball? How straight can the golfer drive the ball? How accurate is the golfer's short game? How well does the golfer get out of traps? How consistent is the golfer? And so we could have these very measurable attributes. These are things we could take out rulers and things and, and measure it. So imagine there are four golfers, person one, two, three, and four, and we evaluate them. Person one is amazing. They do everything amazing. So we give them greens. We give them great numbers. Person two is a mixed bag and person three is well, a little bit bad. <laughs> oh my God, person four is not very good, just consistent at being bad. Um, here, we can evaluate in any given golf course how well the golfer will do. And that's really important. We need to communicate this. Who is the best golfer? But now the question is, knowing these, this information, let's say person four wanted to improve. Let's say person three wanted to improve. Let's say person one wanted to maintain their ability to stay on the top of the game. Does this, while this information is super important to know where they stand in a ranking, it does nothing to help them improve. Okay, so what do we do? So just to, again, obviously, person one is Amy and 
person four is, is me in this analysis here. But um, so if you wanted to improve the game of golf, this techniques, like how does the golfer grip the club? How does the golfer hold their shoulders? How does the golfer place their feet? How does the golfer swing the club? How does the golfer, does the golfer select the right clubs? These techniques actually don't fit on an Excel spreadsheet. These are not very easy to quantify, but they are techniques that are absolutely essential to improve. And so describing how good a golfer is and then describing how to improve that person's golf game uses two different vocabularies, takes an entirely different perspective. And what we're talking about today, it's important to kind of look at this dichotomy that way. Okay, so we have measurable attributes, we have techniques, and it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, how they go off the grip the glove may do this, other. so there is a set of techniques and they're a set of measurable attributes and the two go together, but it's not a straightforward A equals A, B equals B. It's a little bit more complicated and nuanced. And the same thing applies to sustainability. While measurable attributes and sustainability may be greenhouse gas emissions, may be recyclability, may be biodegradation, or persistence or endocrine activity or carcinogenicity or a whole bunch of others. These are measurable attributes. Knowing that number doesn't make you have the ability to improve. So that's where the techniques in chemistry and material science are the 12 principles of green chemistry. And in the same way that there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation, it's a little bit closer, but, there, but the idea is that the green chemistry techniques is how one improves their activity. So let's, let's think about this in a different way. You are companies that have customers. You must communicate information to your customers. To have a competitive advantage, you have to embrace these words, what is your greenhouse gas potential? What is your persistence? What is your toxicity? Whatever, you need to communicate that information. Well, where, why? Where do those numbers actually come from? Well, those things are coming from regulations in NGOs. So the cost of communication doesn't happen from space. It happens from regu you know, government regulations and NGOs and environmental activists and things like that, that inform the customer so that the customer has their desires and their needs. Well, where do the regulations and the NGOs get their information from? Well, that comes from the science of toxicology and environmental health sciences. So we learn about this is toxic because someone did in a lab an experiment or someone did in environmental health sciences some observation. So the regulations and NGOs are informed from toxicology and environmental health sciences, and that then helps us communicate with the customers. And of course, how do we address technologies to improve well, that's the field of green chemistry. And so looking at this from that spectrum of from left to right is green chemistry, the stuff in the middle that we don't have a lot of control over, and then how we communicate with the customers. And so we have to bridge this gap. Now here, I think is the most important thing I'm going to say today, all right? When we communicate with the customer, we're building consumer confidence in individual products. And that is important. And so if we go product by product and say, this product, greenhouse gas, you know, is this, this product, this, that's good. And it's important. We're building confidence in the product. But if we communicate green chemistry, we build consumer confidence in our company. The left-hand side is building brand recognition, and that is going to be far more powerful in the market than 
product by product, look at this product. This. Once your company has the reputation for being the company that understands this better than anyone else, that so it's not one or the other. We must com com communicate about our products, but it's not that simple. It's not just let's talk about the products. It's also if we want to succeed in the future and have a growth within our market and build our brand reputation, that's where it can't be product by product. It has to be what do we do as a company to improve our knowledge base and our science. Okay, so when as we talk about these things, it's not that one is more important than the other. We need to realize that they're two different languages. The vocabulary of con con talking to consumers about individual products is different than talking to the consumer about our brand and what we do internally to address these things. And so obviously we live in a, in a, in a really difficult time in chemistry, things going on in the European Union, things going on in North America. Everybody is, a, is afraid of chemistry right now. Chemistry right now is terrifying the, the, the consumers, okay? It's, they're scared. It's like a monster that's hiding in the dark, going to come out and, and jump and get us. They open up the newspaper, they turn on the radio, they look at the internet, and they hear about all these terrible things happening. This is toxic. This is bad. This is hurting us. And it's like, oh, my God, this is so scary. So it's funny. Chemistry, for the most part, is invisible to the world, except when it's bad, all right? And that, that's a problem. And so if we're going to work on our brand recognition, if we're going to look at this not as just a product by product thing, but how do we, we have to realize that our relationship to society must evolve and must change. And here's the thing. Let's imagine that you have, uh, you're looking at a rock concert, you know, Beyonce is, is performing somewhere. Let's imagine you're at a, uh, at a football match or imagine that you're in Times Square in New York City or some big city. If you look at everything, everything in this picture, every object, everything in this picture is an invention. In that invention, there is some patent somewhere in the world where some people, people invented things. And then behind those patents is probably some publications of some academic scientists that have done this. Now, here's the thing. What people don't understand, what the world does not understand is that the people inventing all of this stuff aren't old, white-haired, crazy men like me. They're a little bit of everybody that the everybody is an inventor. It may not represent the global population distribution, but there are so many inventors that probably the coach of your soccer team invented the fragrance in your toothpaste. Or maybe the person who you, you saw crossing the street invented the flavor in one of the products that you're using. Or maybe someone that is in your house of worship two rows ahead of you invented some you know, polymer release system for a product that has a fragrance in it. Or maybe someone you passed in the airport. What the world doesn't know and doesn't fully understand is the people who work for your companies live beside them. And we are one and the same. And it's not as if the chemistry community and we people in industry are some weird, crazy group of people hidden outside. We are part. And so as we think about how to communicate our brands, my urging to you is to consider instead of putting the data in front, it is important to have the data, put your people. Talk about how this person has worked to invent this technology and hey, they look just like you. They sound just like you and try to demystify chemistry. And, and if you think about flavors and fragrances, of all chemistry products, think of all the chemistry products in the world. What technology is more intimate than scent and flavor? 
at the molecular level, that is touching humanity in an incredibly special way. And so to explain to society just how important the science is and, and show that these inventions aren't from crazy evil people, you know, in towers somewhere, but they're just normal people, I think we have a, a ability to do this. So as the world is going forward in the field of chemistry, keeps expanding and expanding and expanding, we're doing a lot of work to define what we consider safe and sustainable. And here's the thing, as the world of chemistry keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and people are narrowing and making smaller the assessment tools, that doesn't increase the number of products that become safe and sustainable. In a weird and strange way, it actually reduces it. So if we only focus on how we define success, that's not what we got to do. What we need to explain to the world is that we companies are not just defining success, we're changing how we do chemistry. And we and the people that they pass on the street are part of this thing and understand that this is important. And the way we do chemistry is merging and evolving. And so that more and more of our stuff is safe and sustainable by design, because in our labs, we care and we're doing it. And so as we look at these assessment tools, try in your mind today to separate how would you communicate this as a specific product? And how would you communicate it as a company? Because one is important for obvious reasons uh, and, the, and the, the consumer brand recognition is important for the future. If you have the brand recognition built up strong, every change in regulations, every change in consumer demand will trust you because you've created that brand recognition. If it's just product by product, you're gonna be on a treadmill forever. And so that's why green chemistry isn't just product by product, it is about brand, it is about identity. So I hope this, this, this stuff shows that what we need to do is look at the future and say, we can talk about today, what are our problems today and how to address them today. But by the time we're finished, the problems are going to be defined in a different way. So we need to have new eyes and new ideas and look at the future and have a structure in our companies that just doesn't tick the box today, but is resilient for change in the future, looking at that, that brand. And that's the principles of green chemistry. So I hope that this sets the stage for our conversation today and you find this useful. Um, so, so thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. I'm going to um, please, if you have questions for John, if that helped catalyze anything, please type them into the question and answer um, section as we go. We're going to move on. I'm going to ask Martina now to introduce our, our company speakers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John, for the inspiring uh, challenge call for action about the different assessment tools and making sure that we communicate not just the product, but also the companies. And this is what we are doing today. We have in this IFRA Green Chemistry Compass project, we have uh, three companies that volunteered. We asked around to our member companies, would you be prepared to share with the team and the wider membership what you are doing in your company? And I'm very pleased uh, to have received then, uh, three volunteer companies. We have Simrise today, we have Firminich, and we have uh, Man to present their tools. So what we're going to do now is uh, we have first a 10 minute presentation from Jörg Thilo Fischer. And Jörg is the manager for sustainability at the Aroma Molecules Division in Simrise. So we will not take questions after that. We will go straight then to hear from uh, Dr. Francesco Santoro. He is uh, at Firmenich and he joined Firmenich in 2008. And his current position is the director for new ingredient processes in the corporate R&D division. 
and uh, Francesco will speak for 15 minutes. And then uh, we will hear from uh, Man, and here we'll have Cyril Gallardo. And uh, Cyril uh, has worked 12 years, the last 12 years in Man on the 12 chemistry, green chemistry principles. So one year per principle or not. But uh, Cyril is a chemical engineer by education and he is the head of the ingredients division of MAN. So we then hear from Cyril for 18 minutes. And then after we hear those three companies speaking, we go back to Amy and John and John will reflect on what he heard from those companies. And after that, we have an open Q and A. So over to Jörg now. Okay, many thanks, uh, Martina, for this introduction. Um, one moment, I will try to share my uh, to share my screen. So I hope now it must be available for you. Um, yes, hello and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, show you or yeah show you some slides on our um, current initiative for elaboration of a uh, green chemistry score based on our <clears throat> already existing uh, Simrise sustainability scorecard. Uh, this scorecard was um, implemented in 2015. It was patented and um, independently verified by an external expert. And uh, yeah, originally the aims uh, to introduce or to implement this scorecard um, were, were to, to gain better understanding of a degree of sustainability for each of our products, increase, of course, the transparency of environmental impact uh, of raw materials and fragrances, to enhance comparability and optimization of products, and um, yeah, finally, to enable also um, sustainable development and improvement of fragrances. So the main tar target groups were developers and customers, of course. Um, yes, how is it built up? So uh, our scorecard contains in total 10 e equally rated criteria or parameter um, yeah, to assess life cycle impact of, of products. Um, these uh, criteria, criteria are referenced to the 12 green uh, uh, sorry, 12 principles of green chemistry and as well as um, uh, the nine planetary boundaries. Um, uh, the scores of these uh, criteria are without dimension. Uh, they are normalized on a scale from zero to 100 with, of course, a maximum score of 100. And um, they are evaluating yeah, the steps along the supply chains from cradle to gate. Um, so from the beginning. And um, one major advantage, I think it's a major advantage of it, is that it's not only possible to rate individual ingredients, but also formulated products. So fragrance mi mixtures, for example. Um, it's data base based, and so we have plenty of, yeah, yeah, plenty of, 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 uh, uh, possibilities to work with it. Um, on the next slide here, you see uh, the 10 principles, uh, no, the, the, the 10 um, parameters listed um, with short descriptions. Uh, due to time reasons, I will not uh, go from principle, uh, from um, parameter to parameter. Um, what I want to show is that here we, we have this uh, blue frame that um, some of them are assigned to the nine planetary boundaries. This is reflected by this blue screen, uh, or, um, blue frame. Um, and another, or other, no, not other, but uh, so toxicity, ecotoxicity, and, and uh, CO2 emissions are in, in both, or assigned to both um, principles. And um, so the green frame reflects uh, the assignment to the 12 green principles um, of uh, green chemistry principles um, of these uh, parameters. Uh, you see traceability is in none of these groups, um, but uh, traceability is uh, yeah, for us a special criterion. It's not assigned to any of these uh, two principles, but uh, it's a crucial parameter that reflects 
uh, that traceability is important for our uh, sustainability strategy and uh, to be honest uh, for example for rating land use water consumption and biodiversity it's uh, necessary to have trace uh, good traceability um so as i said there were or there are six parameter uh, which are yeah assigned to green chemistry principle and in this figure i try to link them to the green chemistry principles so um, and the linkage should be or the allocation should be uh, direct or um, yeah, a kind of indirect allocation. So a direct allocation illustrates a strong relationship between the green chemistry principles and the scorecard parameter. So um, you can also say that the scorecard parameter is, uh, the rating is displaying a direct assessment of the green chemistry principle. Um, whereas uh, the dotted line shows the indirect allocation. So here the rating or not the rating, the, the connection is um, displays rather a secondary relationship. I will shortly explain it uh, on, on the example of the E factor. So E factor has a direct connection to preventing waste. So to the first green principle, uh, green chemistry principle, um, because of course, uh, yeah, the less um, waste you have, the better is the E factor. Uh, on the other hand, E factor could have or also has a kind of relationship to atom economy, um, yeah, der derivatives or real-time analysis, because these um, green, print, uh, green chemistry principles have, of course, an impact on, on uh, green chemistry principle one on preventing waste, because if the atom economy is good, uh, if you have less um, derivatives in your, um, uh, your chemical reaction or in your chemical process, this leads to, to lower waste and so the E factor raises. And yeah, with this figure we, we tried or we, we want to have an overview, overview how good uh, the, green the chemistry principles are covered by our parameter. And you, you see um, there could be uh, optimization and so uh, we decided to add two more parameter. One is the atom economy, which is directly covering the second the green chemistry principle. And um, another one is a, yeah, a green chemistry process parameter, um, which is covering um, uh, principle three, principle five, and uh, principle nine directly. I want to show you what uh, are what is the content of these uh, print, uh, of these uh, parameters? So atom economy is quite easy because atom economy describes conversion efficiency of a chemical process in terms of all atoms involved and uh, the desired products produced. So you can it's it's a well known and rec recognized criterion. It's easy to calculate. Uh, you just have to. Uh, yeah, use the mole weight of the product and divide it with the sum of um, uh, the, the, the starting materials A and B and uh, multiplicate it with 100. And so you have a, a, a direct uh, yeah, number or direct value which you can use as, um, as a parameter in our or as a score in our uh, scorecard. Um, the only thing is that here with the atom economy you can only it's only applicable for chemical processes so it's not useful for for example extracted material materials which are used in uh, in in fragrances for example um the next or the second principle the the green uh, parameter the green chemistry process parameter here we set this on uh, three pillars the first is the chemical process. Um, chemical process, um, there we, we are rating the reaction type based on, uh, or we want to, to rate it based on the isonorm, on the posit posit positively evalu evaluated reactions, uh, which are um, written down in the isonorm 16128. And uh, uh, the second, um, parameter we are um, rating here is the catalytic reaction if there is 
one um, in, in the chemical reaction. So, and this we figured out could be done best by um, calculating a turnover number. So um, as, as, a, as an indicator for efficiency. The second pillar is um, based or is rating the toxicity of everything what is used during the chemical or uh, is used in the chemical process. So for example, starting materials, solvents and auxiliaries. Uh, here we said um, this rating could be done based on the H phrases uh, similar uh, according to the GHS um, H phrases um, similar to uh, the method which we are already using in our uh, scorecard and the third uh, pillar is the yield so calculating the overall yield of the chemical process and the mean value of these three individual parameters acts as our green chemistry process score uh, as a parameter uh, for our green chemistry score two minutes yep <laughs> thanks um my last slide um so of course during our yeah, our development or our discussions that came up a lot of questions. So for, a, for example, for the reaction types, what or how should we handle uh, demonstrably uncritical reactions, which are not listed in this ISO norm? Uh, regarding catalytic reaction, reaction how uh, could we handle non-catalytic reactions? Should we rate them too or should we leave it? Hmm? And uh, regarding uh, toxicity, so we are not, only we not only want to to rate uh, the chemicals itself so also um, a big um, yeah a, a big uh, importance has uh, the working conditions for example um, which which are applicable in in, in the chemical um, plant and another thing is how we how would we rate or how would we score or should we score recycled solvents for example uh, recycled materials and uh, last but not least um, uh, overall question which comes up very often how should we handle data gaps um, here we have uh, set uh, defined um, uh, solutions in our scorecard and this we also have to, to find out for our two additional um, uh, parameters. Um, short outlook. Um, so as I said, we are in, in a stage of development and um, but I'm, I'm very sure due to its um, <clears throat> systematic of the scorecard of our scorecard, um, the, the green chemistry score could be an integ integ integral part of our sustainability scorecard and um, thus supports uh, Simrise's sustainability offers uh, efforts. Of course, we have we, we are facing different challenges. So, for example, uh, the, dif the different stakeholders. It's not only us from aroma molecules, but also from fragrance CI. They have different expectations, and we need to to have a yeah cross divisional exchange, which is very essential to. Uh, to define the single criteria in a, in a good way. On the other hand, as I said, our, the modular structure of our uh, sustainability scorecard gives us the op opportunity for customized approaches. And um, as this, we are very, very optimistic to integrate uh, also our green chemistry score in our scorecard. So that's from my side. Thanks. I was a little bit too long, but... Was yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jörg. You're welcome. Uh, go straight to Francesco. Yes. Hello, everyone. And uh, let me share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, we see it. All right. So, um, You Francesco, see just um, swap the display. So if you go up to display right. setting, just swap it. Yeah. Uh, I can see. I can swap it. Just oh. let me stop and let me try it again. Slideshow. Is it better? Looks great. Thanks. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. And 
I would like to take this opportunity first uh, to thank uh, IFRA and Beyond Benign uh, for this opportunity to talk about Firmenich and the Econsent Compass. Um, Firmenich started to work on the definition of what is a sustainable product and how to measure uh, and communicate the sustainability of our ingredients back in 2010, uh, in 2011. So we partnered with Quantis, a uh, leader in life cycle analysis, to build an ingredient sustainability index, a set of tools and models to uh, assess the environmental impact of our products across three metrics, uh, carbon footprint, water consumption, and environmental toxicity. We scored all of our ingredients, uh, whether they were manufactured or purchased, but this didn't feel complete. So in 2017, we started to develop two more pillars, uh, fragrance green properties and social impact to create EcoSend Compass as a true holistic fragrance sustainability measurement tool. Again, to do so, we partnered with uh, the most recognized benchmarks and standards to aim uh, long-term for cross-industry harmonization. We wanted to be complete, but we also wanted to create something simple enough to be understood and used really internally, and also easy to communicate in externally. So we included up to four detailed metrics per pillar uh, that are commonly used uh, across the industry. And uh, they're meant really to build confidence for our clients and also to allow them to achieve their sustainability goals, judging them. But we also created uh, an alphabetical scale system uh, from A to E. It's a rating system that is becoming ubiquitous in other consumer industries and uh, it seems to work very well to compare different products and quickly capture the notion whether it is good or it's bad or it's uh, in between. So this transparent approach has been uh, so far appreciated by our clients and uh, we are pleased to see, this is something that I pulled up uh, at the beginning of the week. Some clients uh, uh, even start to use our own terminology to communicate directly to the consumers. You can see here, 80% uh, of in in ingredients are made with green chemistry. This is a value that is directly taken from the EcoSend Compass. And in the description, they say, this perfume has EcoSend Compass AAA rating for green social and environmental impact. And this obviously is a great uh, confirmation that this way of communication seems to work. Now back to green chemistry and let's focus on the fragrance green properties because it's a pillar that houses most of the 12 principles of green chemistry. Even if uh, uh, concepts, as we have seen also by the speaker before, such so concepts uh, such as uh, uh, energy efficiency and water waste, uh, we believe that it's better to uh, consider them uh, in the environmental impact. And I will touch a little bit word, uh, uh, later on. Now, uh, for the sake of time, I will go relatively quickly through the description of the partial scores, but all I'm about to tell you today is described in great details in, uh, in an article in the Current Opinion in Green and Sustainable Chemistry that has been published by a few of my colleagues this year. So first up on the list is renewability. It measures the total amount of renewable carbon from biomass that ends up in the final product. At the ingredient level, the calculation is, is trivial. We just count the number of atoms that uh, end up in the product and come from biomass, uh, divided by the total number of carbon in the, in the molecule. So naturally, uh, natural extracts and uh, white biotechnology ingredients that come from fermentation, they have a, a, a renewability score of 100%. And for synthetics, it depends uh, on the amount of renewable carbon that is incorporated in the final molecule. So it could be anything from zero to 100. At the perfume level, the renewability is, uh, that we report is simply the weighted average of the renewability of the single ingredients in the formula multiplied by their concentration in the oil. And this represents principle seven of the uh, green chemistry principles. Now, principle 10, biodegradability. Again, here we report the percentage of biodegradation observed in lab tests conducted under OECD guidelines. We have uh, four categories. And uh, since 2010, actually, at Firmenich, we follow our Greengate uh, internal policy to say, uh, that is set to allow um, the development of new synthetic ingredients only if they are at least partially biodegradable and not persistent or bioaccumulated. 
Now, then E factor has been said before, it's a, it's a general measure. It's a very common, it's used everywhere in the chemical industry from oil refining to pharma. It is related to the green chemistry principles one, two, and eight. Uh, we report the kilogram of dry waste generated per each kilogram of final product. We don't include water in the E factor calculation for a very simple reason is that most of the water that we use is treated on, on our sites and then re released in the environment. So we prefer to report this in the life cycle analysis. So, in the environmental impact pillar, as we can see maybe a little bit later. Uh, and we report only the water that is really consumed by, from the watershed and it's not available anymore to the flora and fauna. Now, uh, so far, I have covered common in indicators that are used uh, in the industry, they are directly used by our clients. But if we stopped here, we would miss a lot of uh, green, uh, green chemistry principles. So we decided to add a fourth uh, green chemistry property in which we aggregate three additional scores uh, that are directly measuring the quality of our chemistry to encourage our scientists to push the boundaries a little bit of innovation towards sustainability. So just to go quickly between them, the first is carbon economy. We've seen maybe atom economy before, but this is carbon economy. We, we uh, calculate the number of carbons that are intervening in all reagents uh, that, uh, involved in the process, and we divide them by the number of carbon that are really uh, uh, comprised in the final product. This metric uh, penalizes the, uh, the waste, and in particular, the use of temporary derivatives and protective groups. It, it, it is a measure, in a, in a way, of the efficiency and the ele elegance of the chemistry used. Uh, we don't consider solvents and catalysts in this calculation because solvents are mostly recycled. It depends on the campaign size and, and catalysts are used anyway in very such amount, in such a tiny amount. So uh, every solvents and catalysts are, are considered as E factor entering the E factor, but don't enter in the carbon economy. Next, we have catalysis. We have a specific entry for catalysis. Uh, this is a very important area of research at Firmenich, and we wanted to report the number of catalytic reactions used over the total number of steps in the synthesis. Again, the addition of this metric is really to push the development for efficient catalytic processes that we believe it's a key for sustainable chemistry. And last uh, green chemistry criteria is the chemical hazard score. We have seen uh, this as uh, before, we, we uh, I don't want to go too much into the details of the algorithm, but essentially it measures if we are using safe and benign reagents and solvents, or if we are handling hazardous and toxic chemicals. It starts by listing all the GHS uh, hazard statements that we found in the safety data sheets of all reagents, solvents, intermediates, products, everything that intervenes in a, in a production process. And then, we translate them in uh, uh, hazard classes. Now, with one being maybe the most benign of the hazard class and, and, and five being the most dangerous. Now, since we didn't find any uh, external benchmark for this translation, this classification has been done internally uh, with the help of our process uh, safety experts. Then we calculate, uh, uh, essentially we count the frequency of occurrence of each category and use a normalization matrix to get to the chemical hazard score. Um, with this, yeah, I had a little bit of an animation. So all these scores, carbon economy, catalysis, and chemical hazard uh, are normalized uh, over more than 300 ingredients in our palette and converted into a simple uh, percentage that we can share. Now, uh, I have a few minutes, so let's go take a, a very quick look at the environmental impact pillar just to show uh, where the, the green chemistry comes into play. So the carbon emission or carbon footprint is related to uh, principle six, energy consumption. In the carbon footprint, obviously, we measure a lot more, but uh, we measure the impact of the ingredient or perfume on the climate change, including all life cycle uh, stages, and it's, it's converted uh, in equivalent of CO2 emissions. 
it uh, includes only emissions related to the ingredient in, in the sense that, for example, we don't include the emissions related to our administrative buildings, but it takes into a, a consideration scope one, two, and partially of scope three. Um, and then again, uh, as we mentioned before, water, uh, it's based on the EcoInvent database uh, to establish, establish water consumed at all stages from raw materials to production. Uh, and again, water consumed from the watershed is then multiplied by a scarcity factor, which is location dependent, so that we, we impact more if we consume water in, in a region that is already water depleted. Now, uh, I'm sure that uh, I, I reached more or less the end, and I'm sure that you are all asking yourself, yes, but uh, this EcoSend Compass, is it used or it's just a marketing gimmick? Well, obviously, I would, wouldn't be here talking to you today. Uh, EcoSend Compass uh, uh, is become the, the standard sustainability measurement tool across many, many divisions at Firmenich, and it's used for many purposes as well. Uh, I'll give you four, some examples. For example, it's used uh, the EcoSend Compass, uh, the ingredient level for the in, in, uh, internal promotion of new ingredients. It is used as a guiding tool for our creators or our perfumers that they can see the impact of their creation work on the EcoSend Compass in real time as they formulate. And doing so, they can fulfill better the requirements set by our clients. And uh, it is clearly used for the communication with our clients, but it's also used to come to guide them and to educate them on sustainability. And last but not least, it's, it's a key tool to set and measure our ESG ambition. And I took an extraction of just a fraction of uh, our 2030 ESG ambition here to show you these uh, points that are directly linked to EcoSend Compass. Now, obviously, uh, this is not all. EcoSend Compass is in constant evolution, so we are already thinking about new versions and new future improvements. And I'm, I'd like to share with you some of the things we are discussing right now. For example, we are thinking about specific sustainability indicators for naturals. They take into, into consideration the use of the farmland or maybe the agricultural resources depletion. We are thinking about new KPIs for upcycled and uh, biotech and renewable ingredients. We are thinking on uh, how add more granularity to our carbon footprint score to measure, to better fragment the, 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 the score across the process chain, to better understand the sustainability impact, for example, for a new process or a new production equipment or a new supplier and see, simulate the results in real time. We're also having discussion on how to create a, a standalone uh, fragrance green property calculation tool to distribute uh, freely and uh, especially to our suppliers so that they can be able to calculate themselves the fragrant green properties and also maybe for our competitors to be able to benchmark themselves against our products. Uh, I reached the end, it was very fast. Um, I hope I've been able to give uh, you at least a quick insight in how the green, uh, green chemistry principles are included and measured in, uh, in the EcoSend Compass. Uh, and, and a little bit of insight of how this tool is used at Firmenich. Now, I would like to, to thank all the people at Firmenich that contributed to the development and the improvement of this amazing tool. And, uh, and, uh, and I'd like to thank you all for your kind attention. I'd be happy to answer all your questions in the Q&A session uh, after the next speaker. Thank you, Francesco, very much on time. Uh two minutes uh, before your allocated time. This was very insightful to see how your company approaches this uh, green chemistry topic. Thank you. And we immediately move over to Cyril Gallardo. Thank you, Martina. Thank you, everybody. So I'll try to uh, drive you through uh, uh, our green motion tool uh, in man, which is the, the way we do uh, assess uh, green chemistry for ingredients and for formulation. So um, you see in the summary, it will be um, uh, a presentation in three parts. Um, I'm, I'm being helped by David because uh, yeah, it's my partner on this one. So three three parts, one, why? Somebody's not seeing the screen. Uh, I'm seeing uh, David's screen. Yeah. 
So first is uh, why did we create a green motion? And uh, second is uh, how does it work actually? And, uh, and the last part will be a bit, bit more interesting in how do we apply that for the past uh, 10 years uh, within MAN. So it all started by the consumer, in fact. Uh, uh, we, um, if, if we look at, at uh, we made some surveys and it started by what we named the supermarket syndrome. And I'm sure you, you face this, uh, you also. Uh, going to supermarket and consumer, they are confused between all the claims and, and they, they they are looking at biodegradable, but also uh, silicon free or uh, without this, without that, natural origin. And you know, they don't understand everything is not all of this, but consumers sometimes confused between, uh, between the different uh, concepts. Um, so there are people saying that they don't they have a black screen, but uh, I don't know for the rest of the team. Uh, Francesco is fine for you? Yeah? Okay. I see it fine. <laughs> um, so I continue. So basically our idea was to, to uh, try also to educate our, our customers who can then educate the consumers and try to take everything, address everything in a wall. And which is very interesting and we see on, on the next slide. When we do a survey in different um, in different countries, and we ask to consumer, what's a green product for you? And then you have different uh, responses according to the, depending on the country. In France, it's more 100% natural is, a, is a green and uh, okay. If you go to, uh, to Germany, it's more biodegradable. And if you go to UK or US, it's more eco-friendly product. And more interestingly, then if we ask a second question, okay, it's 100% natural for you, but what's behind? What does it mean for you? For French people say, hey, 100% natural is eco-friendly and good for my health. And same in Germany, biodegradable, yeah, it's biodegradable, but because I think it's eco-friendly. So at the end, the, uh, uh, the consumer really is looking for something more general and more eco-friendly for him, for the planet and for his health. So this is why, even if they don't master the differences between the concepts of natural and we see that uh, and biodegradability and so on, it's a good way to eco-design something, it to take everything into account. And that's why we decided to create something which is uh, which was green motion. So uh, on the next slide, we can see what were the constraints. The constraint of green motion. First, yeah, very quickly, well, we not go back uh, to this one. Uh, we we all read the book of uh, Paul Nassas and John Warner, I assisted to some conference. So no doubt on that, we have these 12 principles of green chemistry you can see on the next slide. But then we move on, uh, uh, on how to analyze that. We have these 12 principles of green chemistry, but we don't have, or we didn't have a quantitative tool, quantitative tool exception of the E factor, everybody is now looking, uh, using the E factor from Professor Sheldon, measuring the amount of waste per kg of final product. And we have on the other side, the life cycle analysis, which quantifies the basically CO2 emission per kg of products with a huge, uh, a huge work. Then in our industry, opposite to our customers and our suppliers, we have a lot of ingredients to assess. We have more than 1,000 proprietary ingredients within our company. And we, it's quite unique in the industry. We are mixing plenty of plenty of stuff to make our fragrance or, or, or flavor, uh, flavor compounds. And then uh, I did limited time and resources because I mean, none of, uh, of our companies can uh, put a full team of people working 100% for five or six years to make life cycle analysis of 100 plus uh, thousand ingredients. So it's just uh, not possible. So you need to make some compromise and this is where uh, green motion appeared. And green motion basically is, um, we can see on the next slide, uh, the, so this is a movie you can see on our website uh, uh, if you want to, uh, to have um, uh, a glance of green motion in two minutes. It's free on the website. It will explain uh, everything uh, in a better way I'm, I'm, I'm doing now. <laughs> but then uh, on the following side, you can see that uh, it's green motion is a multi-criteria methodology based on the seven concepts you see on the right. These seven concepts 
recovers covers all the 12 principles of green chemistry in a flow which is coming from the raw materials down to the end product. In each of these concepts, and the first one will be the raw material, we are you asking some easy question to uh, to the chemist or to um, the supplier or whoever has to uh, create a green motion mark, asking simple question on, uh, for example, here, here the renewability of the material, uh, what kind of process uh, is it? A chemical, microbiological, is it an extraction? And each time you answer to uh, to a question. Uh, you get some penalty points starting from 100 and you can go down even to, to negative scoring, but which is uh, not the idea. So you have the raw materials, then you go to number two, which is the solvent you're using. And each time we had some, uh, some information coming from um, publication, uh, scientific publication, or in this case, databases. Uh, and we have now uh, an even better database coming from the ACS ranking the solvents, for example. So we are using this uh, available ranking to give and to attribute some penalty points each time you're using one or several solvents. So, uh, so uh, you really understand if you're using six solvents in a multi-step extraction or, or multi-step uh, synthesis, you'll be losing a lot of penalty points. So this was using just solvents the first time. And then you go to number three, and number three uh, is taking a into account the toxicity of all reagent used. So being the solvent, second time they have penalties, or being uh, the raw material, the catalyst, uh, anything. And then again, to rank the toxicity, what do we use? We have the uh, worldwide, the GSS uh, pictograms with behind the pictograms, all the, the phrase risk. This is worldwide uh, recognized. It's the same uh, in each company, in every company, in every country. So according to these uh, phrase risk or uh, pictograms, you can attribute penalty points to all your reagents, being the intermediate, uh, being uh, raw materials, or being, uh, being the catalyst you are using. Then you go into uh, number four, which is uh, what's going inside the vessel or the vessels. So everything linked to reaction efficiency. And this applies to extraction or to, uh, to synthesis or to biotechnology products. Then we are asking questions on the number of steps. The idea is to limit the number of steps. We, uh, questions about the yields of all the individual um, uh, operation, uh, reducing the number of derivatives, and promote atom economy. Uh, uh, we've been talking about uh, trust uh, atom economy. We switch that to the carbon economy, which is more in line with our, what our industry uh, is doing. So you have all the reaction, and then you go to the energy step. And again, uh, which is step number five. In the energy consumption, uh, you have the choice to make something comparable to the life cycle analysis and try to measure uh, specifically the amount of CO2 extracted uh, used by uh, number of kg of product, but sometimes it's very difficult. So we, we use a very simple um, uh, way to measure the energy consumption, which is valid at plus or minus 10%, I would say. Uh, if you don't know your exact consumption, you know the way uh, when you're using energy, when are you using energy, when you heat, when you cool, when you steer, all of this uh, uh, operation. And this is the example of the heating process. Even if you don't know exactly how do you consume, uh, you know uh, what you're using as uh, heating mean. So is it gas, steam, what kind of pressure? And you multiply that by the uh, length of, uh, of your heating process. And it gives you this kind of table uh, with a number of penalty points, uh, which is high if you're using uh, gas for a long time and which is uh, low if, if you, you just steer at, uh, at normal temperature. Um, and at the end, uh, you need to uh, measure the impact of your final product and after on your waste and, and, and you're done. So the final product, again, you're going to uh, looking at uh, the GSS uh, pictograms of your product, looking after uh, the safety, the biodegradability, and, uh, and uh, you can go uh, quite far into the, um, into the phrase risk. That's for the final product. And the waste, uh, we are using the uh, the um, e-factor, uh, so that number seven, 
we're using the uh, Sheldon E factor in order to, to measure the, uh, the uh, waste impact. And we are adding the environment caution, which is measuring the uh, nastiness of the waste and not only uh, the quantitative, uh, the, yeah, the, the amount of the waste. So all of these together gives you a mark uh, between zero uh, and 100. And, and what we did to make all of this, we try to balance all of these uh, different uh, elements uh, in order to make a tool which is a continuous improvement tool, meaning if you improve one of these seven concepts, you need to see a, a difference in your green motion mark. Okay, so then we move into what, how do we apply that? Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, a summary, just to say, yeah, it's based on 12 principles, you've seen that. The data, when available, they are recognized uh, by, uh, by publication. Our uh, tool has been published in uh, 2015, the Journal of Green Chemistry, and it's available for free on our website. Anybody can, can uh, try and test. And, uh, and anybody doing the same extraction uh, or, or synthetic uh, around the world should find quickly, in half an hour, uh, the same results uh, everywhere. So if you want to apply green motion, uh, we have to integrate it into our system. This is what we did uh, 10 years ago. It's integrated into our formulation, formulation tool and uh, fully automated. Means that once we had rated 100% of our ingredients, automatically all our fragrance and flavor composition have been uh, calculated and are in this system. It gives us a huge amount of data. It's more than 10,000 uh, composition that are rated every year. And this allows us to, uh, to, have, uh, to capitalize on this data to uh, continue to improve uh, by segment uh, or by ingredients uh, for, uh, for our customers and finally for, for the consumer. So if we look at how it looks like in two, um, in two, um, in two months results, there are three steps and we are all working in the same industry, so we understand very easily, but this you need to explain sometimes a little bit longer. We are making fragrance ingredients. When we, make this frag we mix these fragrance ingredients, we are making the, the, the fragrance for our customers. Our customers, they may have a base formulation using some formulation uh, ingredients, and they mix all of these to uh, make the finished product. So we are working as a company on the fragrance ingredient level and the fragrance level. But we can help our customer doing the same, which is much more easy because they don't have 1,000 different uh, formulating ingredients to help them calculate the green motion impact index, sorry, on the finished product uh, if they wish to. So this is very uh, interesting, this three steps uh, level. If we um, approach, sorry, start by step number one, which is a fragrance ingredients to our, our core uh, uh, job. What do we do with green motion? Our chemists in research development, our process engineers are using this tool to develop the new ingredients and to improve the, uh, the uh, performance of already known ingredients by reprocessing, reworking on the process uh, when, uh, when it's necessary. To measure that, uh, uh, or to show the improvement, we, 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 we rated everything and you have a curve on the next slide when you see all our ingredients uh, are between zero and 100, they don't reach 100, but uh, you can see that we, we, we use green motion in a way that nothing is between 55 and 52. We try to push everything between zero and 100 in order again to be able to measure uh, our improvement. And on the next slide, you see uh, our commitment internally in order to measure and quantify this improvement. So we set a, a green limit at 15, at 50, just to be able to measure the amount of ingredient, which is above 50. So you see that in 2017, we had 70% of ingredients above 50. And now we reach in 2020, 84%. And the goal is to reach 90% of the ingredients above 50. All new ingredients has to be above 50 by 2030 and then maybe in the future we'll, we'll change these, uh, these uh, objectives and uh, push the green limit to maybe 60 or 70 to continue to improve at the ingredients level. 
Now, when we move to the formulation level, it's the job of our formulators, our perfumers and flavorists. They have the database, they have all the green motion index, all the ingredients. And when they formulate, they have the choice to pick and choose uh, ingredients with a better green motion. And use, doing that, they can uh, dramatically improve the uh, green motion index of the formulation, which is calculated by the weight, the per weight percentage of each uh, individual ingredients. And I just want to show you an example in the fabric care category. Uh, so the curve is uh, the green motion uh, repartition of all the fabric care product we make at MAN with uh, uh, a mean which is 54, which is quite good. And we have a customer with two brands. It's green brand because formulate green with them, uh, biodegradability, 100% natural and, and other green feature. And you can see that the green brand is in the top 10%, the, the best of the best in this fabric care uh, repartition with green motion index uh, above 70. And they have another brand, uh, which was initially at 48. The way formulate for this brand was a green motion of 48 doing nothing special. Uh, but just the, the olfactive uh, performance. And they asked us to reformulate that using green motion. And using green motion with the work of formulator, uh, picking and choosing different ingredients according to the green motion index, they were able to improve the green motion mark by 20 points, which is huge, just by formulating in a different way. And this is my message. There are this step number two. You need to, to work from the beginning with your customer, picking and choosing ingredients from the very beginning with different environmental impact. And this improves a lot the environmental impact of, uh, of the end process, of the end product, sorry. So this is second stage. And then even if we can uh, want to go, uh, to go further, we can see on the, on the, on the third slide, uh, we can do the same for the finished product, and we have a couple uh, of uh, examples, in partnership in general with the customer, uh, or the customer can do it himself on the free uh, tool uh, on, uh, on our website. And we can see the summary on the, on, the, on, the, on the next slide. Partnering with the customer, we calculate also the uh, green motion index of all their additives or, or color uh, product they put uh, in it. Uh, and then it's easy for, for them to calculate the base formulation or can do it together. And at the end, uh, we can rate the environmental impact of the final product and the customer can use it, uh, the customer, sorry, or not on the, on, the, on the final packaging. And we have an example on another category, I think I've shown that the next slide, uh, on, uh, on the fine fragrance uh, part, for example, we had the um, uh, a perfume which needs police to be green, which was made by our perfumer Veronique Dibert. Eco designed uh, a fine time is up. Sorry? You need to come to an end. You're over time. Yeah, I, I, I'm done. So, this is an example where the, the eco design they claim the green motion use on the finished product. And the final slide, just summary of what I've already uh, said. Uh, it's a transparent and easy to use tool, half an hour if you know your product. And uh, again, uh, we try to improve each time there is something coming from the industry, uh, a new database or a new evolution, we can uh, we try to add that to our tool uh, in order to, uh, to comply with the new uh, regulation uh, or the new uh, uh, asks for, uh, from our customer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to Amy and John. Wonderful, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Those were fantastic tools. Um, we're gonna ask John a little bit of an open-ended question, but John, um, you know, please, you know, any, any sort of thoughts, reflections, we know that some of, you know, measuring sustainability is, is not easy. Um, so we, we just heard from a few, so would love your perspective on, on this to start the, the question and answer discussion. Well, 
you know, first of all, Jörg, Francesco, and Cyril, I congratulate the three of you for coming up with, with very unique and different ways. There's some commonality to what everyone's doing, but there's some difference. And from my perspective, you know, when you think of that picture that I showed you that on the left-hand side, there's what we do inside in green chemistry, and then on the right-hand side, what we communicate to the outside world. Let's be clear part of the left-hand side is our competitive advantage. It's not something, you know, if, if we had a meeting to say, how do you cost effectively make an encapsulant? You're not going to tell everybody how you make your encapsulant. That is a competitive advantage. And so it's the same thing. How we internally invent green chemistry is at some level, a, a, a competitive advantage in what works for one company may not be the same tool that works for another company. That's what makes us all individuals and all different. And so you can see how there are aspects of individuality in each one. Now, of course, at the end of the day, you need a successful product that the world will buy. So there is a convergence on how we communicate it. But it's interesting, the nuance of what we communicate to the outside world and how we invent our products. Every, there's a lot of diversity on the how but not on the what we're ultimately talking about and why we do it. That's where the universality comes in. So again, it's really interesting to see all these things. I, you know, if we had a lot of time, I would love to have conversations with each of you. You know, I, I see, you know, oh my God, have you thought of this? And oh my God, have you thought of this? But that's how science works. We communicate and then somebody builds on it. And so everything, all three of these approaches have amazing ways of looking and I compliment you. And like I said, I wish we had so much more time so I could, yeah, you know, I want to say, well, wait a minute, principle 11 actually fits over here, <laughs> but you know, some other time perhaps. But thank you very much for the amazing work that, that you're all doing. And the key is brand recognition. The very fact that you're doing this work in communicating to the outside world that you're doing this is just as important as what you're doing. The fact that the world knows that you're doing it, because unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't understand how much time and effort and resources, you know, that, that you know, Simrise, Furmanish, and Man are doing to address these things, that it's a lot of people don't even know you're doing this work. So that's why it's so important to be publishing in the journals and going to conferences and celebrating this work, because if the world doesn't know you're doing it, they assume you're not. And so the whole industry needs to recognize that most people don't understand how hard we're working to try to do this. And so I not only compliment you on what you've done, but on your efforts to communicate it to the outside world. Great, thank, thank you so much, uh, John, uh, for your reflections on that. We now have the time for the Q and A. Yeah, so we have uh, still a very, very large audience uh, of more than 150 participants, I see on my screen. So we still have a huge crowd listening to this webinar. Um, do we have anything in the Q&A? Yeah, yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll ask Amy, um, Amy Perlmutter to oh. maybe start with uh, one question. And we do have see one person with a hand raised. So we're gonna message you and see if you would also, if you have a question as well, while, while Amy kicks us off with the first question. Great. Um, so thank you to everybody. That was really interesting and you know, all, all different approaches. And, and I guess it, one of my questions is just um, what kind of internal reaction are you get? Did you get to the tools as you were creating them and as you use them? Are the scientists supportive of this? Was there pushback? Um, how is that? How, how is everybody coming together around this? Uh, I can start. Uh, uh, when we implemented that first, yeah, it was seen as a, an additional constraint for the perfumers, for example. They had also already constraint of price from the customer or the regulation. And then above that, we put an additional constraint, which is green motion. So it was seen uh, this way for at the beginning. Um, but the constraint disappeared the day you formulate from scratch 
using this kind of tool. I'm sure it's the same in other companies. You can, it's difficult to apply the tools to something which already exists because you deconstruct your formulation, but you can start thinking differently from the beginning and then you can immediately see the difference, the way you formulate and, and in your results. So it's uh, very powerful the day you think a little bit differently. It took some time. Great, anybody else want to respond to that? Yeah, maybe I can give the Firmish perspective. Um, uh, the the, the Ecosan Compass was, uh, I think it was an, an initiative of the ingredient division together with uh, the perfumery. Uh, I think it, be, it, be, it became evident that we needed to have this conversation based on the interaction we have with our with our clients, essentially, because they had to have a way of uh, also to have claims that are based on something about renewability and sustainability of their ingredients. Um, for it, w once it was uh, adopted and formulated and deployed, I would say, it, it was uh, mind opening for the scientists because uh, well, we are now have a very common and concrete way of evaluating uh, how green we are and, uh, and uh, very well accepted by our perfumery because it, it gave them exactly the communication tools they needed to interact more uh, scientifically uh, with, our, with our customers and with also uh, consumers in general. And today, I, I don't think we would be able to work without. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question um, from Chris, Christiane Lally, Lally saying that while there are common principles under, underpinning each of your tools, um, <coughs> excuse me, do you have any sense of how these this schemes or scores compare versus each other? If somebody were using the same, um, trying to score the same ingredient, how would they work differently with each tool? Well, I can start. I think we might start from this. A lot of uh, initial data are the same, but then we don't score them exactly in the same way. Uh, even uh, E factors is uh, it's not communicated. The simple metrics are not communicated in the same way. I think this is maybe an opportunity for us to uh, to to join. I think I, I, I'm looking forward to these discussions because I think it's in the interest of everyone. Uh, especially the consumers to have a common um, way of reporting this, these values, especially since they are based on the same logic and the same algorithms. So at, at the end of the day, we scored ourselves against our palette because this is the only one that we have. We scored also based on competitors of ingredients that we buy. Uh, for most of them, we submitted questionnaires to our uh, suppliers to ask them to, to fill them. Uh, for the um, uh, green fra fragrance green properties, uh, we had to guess a little bit the chemistry based on their publication, based on their patents, to have a few data that were missing. Uh, but it would be honestly would be very great to have a, a very a more, a more similar way of scoring things. Yeah, share your point of view. Just to elaborate on that, I may answer also another question on, on uh, from Jonathan Wara asking is some material score particularly well and some poorly. I, I think we could benchmark our, our method and we'll find out that if you make an absolute using uh, hexane uh, or petroleum-based uh, solvents with a yield of 0.1% generating uh, E-factor of, uh, of uh, 1,000, uh, all the method will, uh, will, uh, will give bad score to this uh, kind of uh, extract being natural extract, which is very interesting to communicate to uh, customers and consumers. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I think the methodology uh, points toward the same result and we, yeah, we could do uh, interesting round robins. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, and just following up on that, what kind of reaction are you getting from your suppliers? Are they forthcoming with, you know, filling out the tools telling you what where things come from to help you score things uh are you getting pushback small suppliers will tend to answer very honestly and use the tool the the, the bigger the supplier the more difficult the communication is <laughs> but it's improving 
yeah, more That's good. yeah. from us. Uh, it's a, it's really a, a mixed bag. Sometimes it, uh, the question we ask, uh, we we try to uh, run them through uh, critically to see uh, how they answer those questions. And sometimes we have further questions. Um, it, it it really depends. Uh, but I, I agree with the Cyril uh, general picture um, distinction between big and small. Well. Interesting, because I know a lot of companies are are depending on their suppliers to give them truthful information. That's that's really the basis of, of all the all the information and scoring. Um, we've got another question in the chat. Have the performance of final products been reduced when working with only high scoring green chemistry ingredients? Has performance changed at all? Not at all, because performance part of the brief has price part of brief, and we are just adding an, an additional feature. And uh, again, with the more with the thousands of uh, ingredients we do have into our palette, uh, it's easy to find performance uh, ingredients and performance uh, formulation uh, with only green ingredients. Right. Really easy. <laughs> As our perfumers would put. Uh, Nobody's going to buy a perfume that has uh, the perfect green score, but it doesn't smell good. So. Terrific. Um, and I think Francesco touched on this a little bit, but are there some groups of, um, I just lost the question. Are there some groups of materials that score particularly well and some particularly poorly for all of you? Are you finding that? Group of materials? Yeah like uh, naturals and synthetics and uh, biotech. Uh. Actually, that was Jonathan War's question. So Jonathan, if you want to unmute and maybe clarify what you were what you meant. Thank you. You unmuted me. I was figuring out how to unmute. Okay. Uh, Cyril already had one go at the answer, I think. And he understood is about, for example, we have some materials like absolutes, which, which uh, tend to have low yield and, and solvents. I just, I'm just wondering if you, you all agree that these ones perhaps score rather poorly. And then I think the idea of benchmarking a really good scoring one, a medium scoring one and a bad scoring one would be really interesting to see how, how each of the tools does it. I think it'd be really great. But that, that was the question, actually. Yeah, yeah, and on the on the, on the good scoring, it's uh, it's obvious that uh, one step chemistry with good yield, uh, catalyst, uh, low temperature uh, will 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 give good scores. And same for biotech. Biotech has uh, a lot of green features, and you have it's diluted, so you have post process, which is uh, which is uh, sometimes a little bit complicated. Otherwise, uh, fermentation is a great product to according to green chemistry. Yeah, it, it's complicated because it, it also depends on the on the volumes of the ingredients. So uh, obviously, a, a large scale volume, uh, a, a large scale ingredient can can be optimized to recycle most of it. So uh, you you can reduce uh, a lot the um, the E factor. And if you have only one a few kilograms, especially naturals, absolutes, that then it becomes more complicated and economically more, more difficult. But this is the way, the good thing of having these tools, it's because uh, you would see, uh, if you have an improvement of, on, on one ingredient, you would see suddenly the difference and appreciate the difference as well. Great, thank you. We'll take one last question um, before wrapping up. Do the scores, oh, we got, we got two, two more questions. So do the scores just account for ingredient hazards or do they consider risk and exposure as well? Anyone want to take that? Well, uh, EcoSan Compass, we, we for the, uh, so the question was for the um, uh, hazard, right? Chemical hazard. Yeah, um, hazard and risk. Ha do the scores just account for the hazard or do they also look at risk and exposure? Yeah, no. Uh, Currently, this version, we only look, uh, uh, as I said, we compile just the uh, uh, GHS uh, hazard codes that we find in the safety data sheets. Whether it is used one gram over a production of uh, many tons or, or, or it's a solvent itself. So it's uh, everything is put together and, and then scored. 
Obviously, I think that in the GHS uh, classification, there is also this uh, level of risk uh, and, and uh, gravity, increasing gravity. And that's why we translated it in uh, hazard classes. But uh, exposure per se, no, it's not taken into consideration right now. I think the same for us. Uh, uh, we are using, yeah, this uh, phrase risk and, and, and uh, and the limitation of exposure is, is, is our processes, but we, because we are using this reagent, this intermediate, uh, which has a potential toxicity, if we can read, read of it, it's better than using it, regardless of the fact that the employees will be exposed or not to, to them. It's like the energy, the best energy is the one you don't use. It doesn't matter if the energy is coming from renewable sources. If you don't use energy, you don't use energy, it's, it's, uh, it's always uh, greener. Um, I know there's one more question um, in the chat. I also know that it's after 9.30. My, our, here in the States, it's, it's after an hour and a half. So Martina, do you want to, uh, should we ask this last question or do you want to just go to closing remarks? I'll just go ahead and uh, we keep the closing remarks very, uh, very simple. Please go ahead, take the last uh, question okay. and then I'll wrap it up. Great. So the last question is, how do you calculate the biodegradability of a composition? That's really simple. It's uh, the weighted average of the biodegradability of the single ingredients times their uh, uh, percentage in the composition. Great. And it can be a discussion for the next time because biodegradability of a composition, there are huge work uh, worldwide to understand all the, the synergies uh, between the ingredients. So today it's easy, quite easy. <laughs> there are uh, OECD methods to measure the biodegradability of single ingredients. Then when it comes to synergy in the composition, still a lot of work to, to, to do to assess that, but uh, the systems doesn't allow us to, uh, to assess that this way for the moment. Yeah. yeah. Same uh, than Francesco. Yeah. And there's also policy developments here about biodegradability and the IFRA ETF, the Environmental Task Force, is also looking into this uh, particular question, no, not necessarily for compositions, but uh, biodegradability um, definitions, because there are so many uh, different requirements out and there's policy as well. So uh, we have to do more work on this. And with this, we're out of time. Uh, the first of all, thank you all, uh, everybody, our speakers, uh, John and the team behind the scenes. Uh, what are we going to do next? We had today again a lot of food for thought. And on September 20th, we have the third and final webinar with John. And then after that, we want to put together the IFRA Green Chemistry Compass. And we look and digest all this information that we've heard from you know, today, from the companies on building on the commonalities, because we want to give a toolbox to our members, in particular, the smaller members, the SMEs who, who don't really have as much in place as the large companies have. So our goal is to develop a guidance a document that we can add to the toolbox that is relevant to everybody and that will uh, build on the commonalities. So in September for the next webinar, we will have a look at what are other industry doing, because we wanted to know that here's IFRA and IOFI with a sustainability program. And we want to give a compass for our membership in the fragrance industry. And for that, we, we in September will invite another sector who has also taken a sectorial industry-wide approach and we'll hear from them. So stay tuned. And in the meanwhile, we will digest and analyze all this information within the Compass team of which everybody that spoke today is part of. So thank you all very much and uh, speak again very soon. Mark your calendars for September 20th. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.